How powerful is Cox Internet? Powerful enough to let your band members in Vegas, Phoenix, and Rhode Island jam like you're all in the same garage. Get Cox Internet powered by fiber with America's fastest download speeds. It's Internet built for tomorrow, today. Cox, always building better. Cox Internet is connected to the premises via coaxial connection. Speeds vary and are not guaranteed. Cox terms and other restrictions may apply. Analysis by Ookla speed test intelligence data. Fixed median download speeds. USQ3 2023. Slow Burn Media, Evergreen Podcasts, and Killer Podcast presents Who Killed, a podcast that provides a voice for the voiceless. This weekend marks the 30th anniversary of an unsolved murder in Cedar Rapids. Back in 1979, police found the body of 18-year-old Michelle Martinko in the Westdale Mall parking lot. The Kennedy High School senior had been stabbed to death in her car. Martinko's family tells the Gazette they have never recovered from their loss. Prosecutors rested their case this morning in the trial of Jerry Burns. He is the man accused of killing Cedar Rapids teenager Michelle Martinko. Now, after finishing up, Burns' legal team then tried to have their client acquitted today in court, saying that the state failed to prove that Jerry Burns was even at the scene or that he acted with malice or intent. The judge, however, she denied that request. KWW reporter Travis Breeze is live in Davenport right now with how a police investigator's third testimony helped the judge make her decision. Travis. Ron and Abby, investigator Matthew Denlinger talked the jury through another video interview of him speaking with Jerry Burns. This one, a ride back to jail. Now, the prosecutors felt that what Burns didn't say in that video was just as important as what he did and that the only time Burns spoke about the 40-year cold case was telling Denlinger it'd be easy for the killer to block out the memory of murdering Michelle Martinko. Denlinger misheard him and thought he said he blacked out. Uh, he made reference to um, blocking things out. Um, you'll see in the video that I was not able to hear him very well, and I thought he was saying uh, blackout, but he, he corrected me. Did he ever say to you, this must be some kind of mistake? No. That omission was something that the judge did cite when delivering her denial of the defense's acquittal plea this morning, also reminding the courtroom that the court does view evidence in a light most favorable to the state in criminal cases since it has the burden of proof. Reporting live in Davenport, Travis Breeze, News 7, KWWL. Travis, thank you. Now, a number of detectives have worked on this case in its more than 40-year history. Dinglinger took over in 2015. Now, the defense is expected to start presenting its case tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Hello and welcome to Who Killed? I am your host, Bill Huffman, and this is a Slow Burn Media and Evergreen Podcasts production. Before we get started, I wanted to remind everyone who can attend about the Walk for Amy on October 27th, 2021, to honor the memory of 10-year-old Amy Mahalovic. The walk will begin at the Bay Village Middle School, and if you'd like more information, you can visit walkforamy.org. Also, if you didn't get a chance to see me on Snapped Behind Bars, the Taylor Mark story, you can check it out on demand or on the Oxygen Network's website. Again, a tragic case of a spoiled daughter going a few steps too far. I don't have any sympathy for a person who kills their own mom. I mean, it's just awful. Then to deny it through a whole trial, and to this day, is just a disgrace. You set up your mom to be killed. What don't you understand about that? Anyway, she is where she belongs, and will be there for the rest of her life. But hey, check out the episode, just so you can see her lie. It's pretty disgusting. Anyhow, this week we are going to remain focused on some positivity in the true crime world, as murky as it can be. As I stated during the past few episodes, I wanted to focus on some crimes that were still in the age range of Amy Mahalovics to remind the people still looking for a killer that it can happen. With all that being said, this week we are taking a look back at the the wonderful year of 1979, more specifically to a shopping plaza in Des Moines, Iowa. 
18-year-old Michelle Martinko was at the Westdale Mall Shopping Center, and she was looking for a coat for her mother. She had recently been to a school function at the nearby Sheraton Inn, and I believe this was a choir performance. While at Westdale, she spoke with friends and was last seen at a jewelry store around 9 p.m. Little did her friends know that this would be the last time they'd see Michelle alive. So this week, we are looking into who killed Michelle Martinko. Police found her parents, Tan Buick, in the northeast part of the shopping center's parking lot at 4 a.m. on December 20th, 1979. The Des Moines Register and the Gazette did an incredible job covering the case as it unfolded throughout the years, and I will be using some of their fantastic articles throughout this episode. Police said they weren't sure whether that was the same location at which Martinko had parked her car when she arrived at Westdale around 7 p.m. Police spokesman James Barnes said she had gone to school that day, then went to the Sheraton Inn for a banquet. She was supposed to meet someone or go on a date later that evening. She obviously never made it. Wounds on the teen's hands showed that she fought her killer, but the medical examiner's office said that Martinko was found fully clothed and had not been sexually molested. But he did say that based on the number of stab wounds, particularly to the face and chest, police believed that the homicide was of the personal nature. Chief Raymond Baker said the department had no leads. As hundreds of people had shopped in the recently opened Westdale Mall, Michelle Martinko, a senior at Kennedy High School, was stabbed repeatedly in the face and chest by an unknown assailant, according to the Des Moines Register. Lynn County Medical Examiner said a preliminary examination showed the woman died about 9 p.m. He went on to say that there was no evidence of sexual assault and it didn't appear that the woman had been beaten. Now, Chief Raymond Baker did say that he anticipated a difficult investigation. Quote, we're talking to friends and to her teachers, but so far we have no leads. We're hoping somebody saw something or knows something that will be of assistance to us. Sex and robbery were ruled out early in the investigation as motives for the stabbing. Police have not ruled out that Michelle Martinko's murder may have been a woman, although everyone's instinct is to say it was a guy. And she did have what we call defense wounds on her hands, according to Barnes, which indicates Martinko had to try to fight off her attacker. Martinko's steps were traced through 9 p.m. on that last day of her life. Police did announce at that time that they spoke with and cleared a juvenile carrying a knife who was arrested at a local motel, as well as an employee of a store in a shopping center who had admitted to police he enjoyed following women and staring at store mannequins. Wonder what a date night with that guy would be like. Police are unsure whether Martinko was being followed by someone at Westdale Mall the night of the murder. Quote, we've talked to a number of people who work out of Westdale who saw her that night, said Barnes, assistant police chief who heads the detective bureau. Barnes would not disclose much information about two aspects of the case. He acknowledged that some evidence was recovered in a store at Westdale that is being processed by a private laboratory, but he refused to describe the evidence. Quote, We don't even know if it has anything to do with this case. He also refused to disclose whether fingerprints were found in the car that the body was discovered in. About both facts, Barnes said, These are things that we know and the murderer knows. So more than 200 people, by Barnes' estimate, have responded to detectives' calls through the news media for assistance concerning the case. He said that they'd received about 75 tips from the public that were anonymous. Cedar Rapids detectives were, again, appealing to the public, specifically the occupants of two vans, always vans, for information concerning the murder of Michelle Martinko. Assistant Chief James Barnes said this morning, 
at a press conference, the police are looking for the occupants of two vans which were seen in the Westdale Mill parking lot around the time Martinko was murdered. Again, police said that they were not looking for the occupants as suspects in the murder, but as witnesses who might have seen something on December 20th, 1979. Barnes admitted detectives had few leads and, quote, no hard suspects in the case. And Barnes went on to say the police are convinced at least two witnesses in the case have not come forward to offer information, despite the pleas to the public. But he did add that the Michelle Martinko occupants of the van could contact the detective bureau anonymously. Now, again, the first van was described as a black late model custom van with a gray stripe down the side. The van had a purple or maroon curtain that hung over the windows. Total 70s, 1970s thing, mag wheels, a chrome ladder, and a spare tire and tire cover bearing the inscription dual custom. The second van is described only as dark in color. It was reportedly parked at the Westdale Mall Penny's Catalog Center door on the morning Martinko was found stabbed in the family car. The vans were described by witnesses under hypnosis. Cedar Rapids police said Thursday that they now have a composite drawing of the man they believe is a suspect in the Michelle Martinko killing. Barnes said that the man is believed to be in his late teens or early 20s, 5 feet 11 to 6 feet tall, with a medium build and weighing approximately 170 pounds. Detectives said the drawing was developed from information from two witnesses. The witnesses were put under hypnosis to help them recall what they saw at the Westdale Mall parking lot last December. Such a 1980 type of investigation. The Kennedy High School student, again, was found stabbed to death in the Westdale parking lot. Now, the sketch did prompt 225 calls to the Detective Bureau. While most of these calls have been checked out, Barnes said they have provided no further information on the case. Barnes said there was only one further piece of information the police have not released concerning the case. He refused to be more specific about that information as he should be. Cedar Rapids merchants were offering a $10,000 reward for any information leading to an arrest or indictment of Martinko's murderer. Sometimes you find something that looks too good to be true. And this occurred early in the investigation when police in Cedar Rapids became quote-unquote, vitally interested in a 30-year-old drifter who was arrested in Texas and was being questioned about the slaying of 20 young women. The man, they thought, could be a suspect in Artinko's murder. Now, Assistant Chief James Barnes said that when he spoke to police in San Antonio that he learned the man had been charged by authorities in four states, California, Colorado, Texas, and Utah, with eight crimes ranging from kidnapping to murder. Barnes said he telephoned police in San Antonio Sunday after he learned of Morin's arrest and asked about a possible connection with the slaying of Michelle Martinko. And Barnes did say that Cedar Rapids police are, quote, interested in anything remotely similar to our unsolved homicide. We talked to hundreds of people and bad, had many bad leads, but none panned out. Robbery was not the motive and the victim was not sexually molested. He said he jumped on the phone as soon as he heard of the arrest in Texas, but the chief, Ray Baker, probably will decide after more information if we'll send anywhere down there, Barnes told the Des Moines Register. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the leads all began drying up fast. The police would appeal to the public via the newspapers and television news for any information about Michelle's final moments. News of Michelle's death seemed to affect the community differently rather than other murders committed in the city. Now, according to Kurt Rogan, a Gazette staff writer in 1980, quote, for weeks after the murder, the crime remained a topic of discussion particularly among young women. 
From conversations heard in restaurants, stores, and on radio talk shows, it was clear that people were horrified by the violence of the crime, as well as its senselessness. Police warned women not to shop alone during the last week of the Christmas shopping rush. They repeated those warnings just after Michelle Martinko. And again, when two women were assaulted by armed men wearing ski masks a week after Christmas. In the week following the murder, at least two women reported to law enforcement agencies that they thought they had been followed by a man in a car as they drove home. Now again, police have been unable to trace Michelle's whereabouts after she was last seen at 9 o'clock at that jewelry store. Her parents did report her missing at 2 a.m., and her dad had actually gone out looking for her, which is just the saddest image imaginable. And I just feel for the family. It's just absolutely terrible to not have one of your children return home. I just can't fathom. And police did eventually locate the car, and all the doors were locked except for one. And this was at 4 a.m., and again... Unfortunately, Michelle Martinko was stabbed to death inside the vehicle. As the police continued to make pleas with the public, they did result in some people stepping forward. Again, under hypnosis, on several occasions during the spring and summer, two women had described a man in his late teens or early 20s between 165 and 175 pounds with brown eyes and curly brown hair. Police released a composite sketch of the suspect on the morning of June 19th. Now, the photo was still posted on bulletin boards at some law enforcement agencies. Over the year since Martinko was murdered, the police detectives have interviewed more than 835 people, generating more than 400 reports and statements. And this is according to a statement released by Cedar Rapids Police. Quote, we utilized a sketch artist, psychic, and a hypnotist, and we're fortunate to have had a lot of citizen input, as well as a lot of cooperation from the media. And he basically said that there were no arrests in the case, and the murder case is open, and will remain so until the killer is caught. Although police were still eager to solve the murder, the last detective assigned to the case full-time, was now receiving other assignments. In a bizarre incident, police investigated a message in a bottle. Yes, you heard that correctly. A message in a bottle that was found in one of the local rivers that I will not try to pronounce. The bottle contained a note which reportedly warned that the writer was being held hostage by Michelle Martinko's killer in a cabin northwest of Central City. As the case of Miss Martinko dragged on, her family decided someone or something should be held accountable for her death. He filed a lawsuit against the owners of Westdale Mall. Martinko's father, Albert Martinko of Cedar Rapids, had sued the mall owners owners, uh, and Westdale Mall Merchants Association for $250,000, alleging they were negligent for not providing reasonable security for visitors. Martinko's suit said the mall should have been aware of the possibility of criminal activity at the shopping center because of 126 crimes that had been reported at 26 other malls owned by the California firm. Unfortunately for Mr. Martinko, a court dismissed his lawsuit and that dismissal was eventually held up by the state Supreme Court. Almost eight years after the murder of Michelle Martinko, police said that they might have a break in the case. Now, it was television station KGAN that had reported that Cedar Rapids police had renewed interest in the rabbit fur coat Martinko was wearing the night she was killed. Martinko was found again stabbed December 1979. Now, police said a suspect in the murder had fur all over him, but the technology to compare that fur with fur from Martinko's coat was not available until recently. 
However, KGAN said it was unable to learn if tests on the fur had actually been conducted. Linn County Attorney Denver Dillard would not confirm if investigators had tested the fur. Quote, We don't have all we'd like to have to go to court at this time, Police Chief Gary Hinsman said. Hinsman said he just did not want to give the impression that a solution was just around the corner, but added, quote, we may be closer than people think. Dillard said taking the case to court now would require a complete review of all the evidence and reports a task he said would be monumental. Again, this is just one of those situations where you have to wait for the time. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on Chumbacasino.com. I looked over at the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino-style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at Chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's Chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Technology. Let's hear from this week's sponsor. Now, it was, again, the Gazette in an article by Lee Hermiston where he wrote, For the first time since Michelle Martinko was stabbed to death 37 years ago, her sister and brother-in-law can look in the killer's eyes. Using the services of a Virginia-based company that uses DNA to predict the physical features and ancestry of a suspect, the Cedar Rapids Police Department has produced images of a man believed to have killed Martinko in Cedar Rapids on December 19, 1979. Those images were shared with Martinko's sister and brother-in-law, Janelle and John Stonebreaker. And again, they were shared with the public during a news conference at police headquarters. Quote, it's very sobering and disturbing at the same time, said John Stonebreaker, as he stood just feet away from the images. Quote, but it is also hopeful. 19, let's see, this would be 1987 that they would be doing... They did the first break, and then it was another 30 years. And I mean, this is just, DNA is just, it's incredible. It's incredible. And what the suspect might look at age 50. Now, Cedar Rapids public safety spokesman Greg Bellow said that police have used the composites to eliminate some potential suspects. They are now presenting the composites to the public in hopes of generating more leads. He went on to say that the police department has received several inquiries from the public on how they can donate to a reward fund assigned to the Martinko case. Quote, we owe it to the Martinko family and we owe it to Michelle that we find out who is responsible for her murder. I think this is a great shot for us to accomplish that. I believe through this exposure, it's going to give us the opportunity. While the investigators spent a lot of money to get that snapshot DNA, turns out that it all worked because police were able to arrest 64-year-old Jerry Lynn Burns of Manchester on first-degree murder. He was a business owner and was 25 years old when Michelle Martinko was killed. Prosecutors said that a DNA match to blood in the car led to Burns' arrest. But, of course, little else was made about the motive or the mechanics of the crime. Now, again, Burns appeared in handcuffs via video at the Lynn County Jail for his initial appearance when a judge agreed to set his bond at $5 million in cash. Prosecutors called him a flight risk. Quote, this was a brutal Violent, horrendous crime, Lynn County Assistant Attorney Mike Harris said at the hearing. Quote, this is a crime that had a unique and profound impact on the Cedar Rapids community. In the charging documents that were made public, authorities said they were able to find blood on Martinko's clothing that did not belong to her. Two partial male DNA profiles were developed from the blood found in the car one from her clothes, and another from under the gear shift knob. Now, this was all according to police. For one of those profiles, authorities said fewer than 1 in 100 billion 
unrelated individuals would have been would have had the same profile. Cedar Rapids police used DNA genetic genealogical research to quote narrow the profile down to a specific pool of suspects, which included Burns, according to the criminal complaint. Authorities said they collected Burns' DNA quote unquote covertly, but the means were not specified in the court documents. His DNA matched blood found on Martinko's clothes and was consistent with the DNA profile developed from the blood on the Buick's gear shift knob. Now, in an interview Wednesday with police, at his business, Burns claimed he had no recollection of committing the killing, and that was according to court documents. He could not offer a plausible explanation for why his DNA was found at the crime scene. The arrest of Burns and the first-degree murder charge has basically upended the town that Burns lived in. And some of the articles from that time state, the quote, the community is in shock. His friends are in shock. His family is in shock. I feel bad for the victim's family because they've been wondering every day of their life what happened to their daughter, said Russ Wright, who served Burns nearly every day at a local BP station. I also feel bad for, you know, this current family and friends because now they have to go through this as well. Mike McElliott, who was in Burns' graduating class at West Delaware High School, said the two crossed paths as adults in Dyersville, while McElliott was a mail carrier and Burns worked for John Deere. Quote, never did I think he had a mean bone in his body, said McElliott, 64. That's why everybody in the town is just like I am. Shocked. So Burns used to own a truck stop that was near town, and he built a house on the land his parents once farmed, and then constructed a gas station as well as a convenience store near where he lived. Now, he eventually sold those properties off. Now, again, he was arrested in December, and this was 39 years to the day following the killing of Michelle Martinko. Again, the detectives obtained the DNA covertly from Burns, and he denied killing the woman during an interview with police, but again, couldn't provide a reason for why in the world his DNA would be in in this girl's car. And a jury convicted Jerry Lynn Burns of first-degree murder in the 1979 death. It was a case, Cedar Rapids Police Chief Wayne German said, quote, that has haunted our community for decades. We don't know the whys and some of the details, but we definitely know who did it. And that was terribly important to us, Janelle Stonebreaker, Michelle Martinko's older sister, told the paper. I wish my parents could be here to see this. Unfortunately, the parents had died 20 years prior, uh, and that is just a sad, sad case of not being able to see justice when it should be done. And again, it was, um, you know, two weeks of testimony and a jury of seven women and five men only deliberated for three hours and they came back with a guilty verdict. And again, it's the decades of technological advancements that were able to allow experts to construct this partial male DNA profile. And again, if it wasn't for GEDmatch, which of course is a public site, genealogy site, investigators wouldn't have been able to narrow down the profile to Burns. And now, I stated earlier that it was covertly obtained, his DNA, that is, and it came out in court that it was from a straw at Manchester Pizza Ranch. (laughs) Sweet name. (laughs) And again, he rebuted some of the prosecution's factual claims, insisting that there was substantial evidence that Burns' DNA was retrieved from his blood, noting previous testimony indicating it could have been saliva or even transferred skin cells, and that the presence of DNA in itself could not implicate Burns. Burns' attorneys couldn't even offer an alibi, though, when they were asked. And his defense attorney spies did suggest that 
since Burns had been to Westdale Mall with his family before, DNA he left behind there maybe could have transferred to Martinko while she was at the mall. That is the most ridiculous thing I have ever heard. Clearly, this guy doesn't understand anything. Maybanks countered that witnesses in the two weeks prior had outlined an extensive chain of custody of the evidence to ensure no new DNA could have been introduced into the packages containing Martinko's bloodied clothes and pieces of the car. The only way Burns' DNA could have ended up in two spots in the crime scene, Maybanks concluded, was if Burns was the murderer. And again, in the end, the jury agreed. Now, before the 6th District Judge Faye Hoover sentenced Burns to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Now, Burns never showed any emotion during his trial and gave a short statement. Burns said, quote, Somebody else stabbed Martinko that night. He didn't know who or why. Burns then turned towards his family, sitting in the courtroom, and thanked them for their support. Now, Burns had maintained his innocence in pretrial hearings and throughout the trial, but the jury took, again, only three hours to reach a verdict after hearing the DNA evidence. Apparently, his wife and other close family members were allowed to attend the sentencing, but of course, during the pandemic, there was social distancing, so there were limited spaces. And again, the cold case murder drew national attention because this was, again, genealogical DNA. And another crazy thing that this defense attorney, Leon Spies, did before the trial, before a new trial, or wanted a new trial, he said that's arguing many of the same issues that had been ruled upon before, but he also said his private investigator had uncovered new evidence that was discovered, undiscovered, until June. A retired music teacher, Catherine Berkey of Swisher, who taught private piano and organ lessons, said she had a regularly scheduled lesson with Martinko in the Westdale Mall the night of the attack, according to spies. Now, according to an affidavit, Berkey, in a phone interview with an investigator who works for the sp- for spies, said she had been giving organ lessons to Martinko in 1979 at Karma Lou's House of Music. Martinko had lessons between 8.30 and 9 p.m., Berkey said. Berkey said she recalled Martinko was dressed up that night and said she came from a musical banquet. And this is, again, according to the affidavit. Martinko always came to her lessons alone, but may have had someone waiting for her outside the mall. The investigator reported Berkey said the lessons were once a week, although she wasn't sure which day of the week they were. Again, this is absolutely ridiculous. Spies argued that if the defense had this evidence at trial, jurors might have come back with a different verdict. Now, Maid Banks had his opportunity. He pointed out that Martinko's sister and brother-in-law said that Martinko didn't take organ lessons, Carmelou's house of music wasn't even in Westdale, and none of the many witnesses who testified at trial about seeing Martinko at the mall that night never mentioned it. He also said it was quite difficult to believe that Law enforcement never came across such information in the nearly 40 years of investigation. Judge Hoover reviewed Spy's written arguments and pretty much said no. (laughs) Maybanks, again, is asking Hoover to sentence Burns to life and that this verdict and sentence would not only give peace to the family and many friends of Martinko, but would also provide enormous relief to the community. Maybank said it was likely nobody will ever know why Burns committed the crime. I mean, the teen was stabbed 29 times, and that is according to testimony. And a pathologist did state at testimony that the fatal stab wound was to her heart and that she bled to death. Burns' DNA profile was again developed from blood on Martinko's black dress. So, testimony showed that Burns was the major contributor of the profile. Less than one in 100 billion of unrelated individuals would have had the same profile. And that is according to Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation. So, there you have it. Another decades-old cold case solved. You see, good things can happen in true crime. 
it just may take a while to find the justice you are seeking. To the whole Martinko family, I express my deepest condolences, as I do to the people who were duped by Jerry Burns. The most frustrating part about this whole case is the fact that Burns won't confess to what actually happened on that dark, cold night in December 1979. If he would cop to the crime, I think that would be even more helpful for the community, the family, as well as the investigators. I assume Jerry Burns' life has been picked apart by investigators by now, but it is so unusual to commit such a horrific crime only once. His current friends said they never saw a dark side, but what about his old friends? Nowhere in my research did I see the news discussing the kind of guy Burns was in 1979. Kudos to the investigators for never giving up, Parabon Nanolabs for doing what they do so well, and of course to Jedmatch for being what they are. Despite not having all of the holes in this case filled, the community, the investigators, and the family, I'm sure, can sleep better at night. And that is our show, so thanks so much for listening. And look for Nick from the True Crime Garage podcast on next week's show. Thanks to Best Fiends for sponsoring this week's episode. You can find the mobile puzzle game in the Apple App Store or Google Play. As a reminder, the Walk for Amy is Wednesday, October 27th at 5 p.m. at Bay Village Middle School. For more information, visit walkforamy.org. Or you can find... And you can find more information and make donations on their website. You can find new episodes of Who Killed every Friday wherever you get your favorite podcasts. As always, if you do enjoy this show, you can help contribute with my PayPal username at WilliamHuffman3 or via Venmo with my username at Bill-Huffman-3. Every contribution, big or small, really does keep these shows on the air. Now... If you want to support the show by leaving a five-star review, that would be great as well, because those five stars do help keep it the cases that I cover, such as Amy Maholovics in the spotlight. And if you want to stay up to date on the cases I have covered, as well as the new shows that I have lined up, please follow me on Twitter at BillHuffman3. Thank you so much again for listening. Until next time... As always, be healthy and stay safe. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right, ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary, full work limited by law, 18 plus, terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi, I'm Matt Harris. Seton Tucker and I host the podcast Impact of Influence, which for two years covered in depth Alec Murdoch, who was eventually convicted in 2023 of murdering his wife, Maggie, and son, Paul. That story continues to evolve, and we will cover that. Plus, we will tell you stories of other true crime events that have happened in the South. Please join us on Impact of Influence. And give us a follow on the Impact of Influence Facebook page.